A girl named Olivia used to make videos for YouTube. Her best friend Marky arrives. She asks Olivia to go with her on vacation. Olivia refuses, but when Marky insisted she agreed to go, they go to Mexico with their other friends. Olivia meets a boy when they are in a bar. His name is Carter. They become friends. Olivia's friends arrive there. They all want to go to a place where they can do a party for a whole night. Carter says he know a place where they can do party for the whole night. Marky doesn't want to go with him. She asks Olivia to go back to the hotel room, but all of them makes her agree. Carter takes them to a deserted church. They get shocked to see that place. They start playing truth or dare. Carter panicked when it was his turn. He tells that he chooses Olivia as a target. Carter brings them here for playing the game. He was in search of a person with friends who can come here easily. They all consider it funny. Carter is about to leave, and Olivia tries to stop him. He tells her that this is a real game, and once you have participated in this game, there will be no escape. You will die if you lie, and will not complete the dare. Your death is confirmed if you try to leave the game. They have to follow all rules. Carter leaves after telling this, and Olivia doesn't take him seriously. She doesn't find her friends, but then suddenly her friends appear in front of her. They were looking terrible. This is just hallucination of Olivia. She finds her friends, and they are fine. Olivia gets scared. Her friends take her from there. Olivia comes to the classroom for taking a class. Truth or Dare was written on her table. Adhe seems it strange, but she ignores it. Later, she finds some pamphlets when she reaches home. Truth or Dare was written behind one of them. Olivia becomes surprised to see this. Marky arrives. She tells Olivia that after her father's death, she only believes Olivia. Olivia tell her that there is nothing like what she is thinking. She has no interest in her boyfriend. She considers him as her brother. Marky believes Olivia and becomes happy. When Olivia comes out, truth or dare is written on her car. Olivia becomes furious at the boys standing nearby. She thinks they have done this. She shouts at them. Then she reaches the library and finds everyone looking terrible. They surround her and compel her to choose truth or dare. They force her. Olivia chooses truth. They ask her together that what secret her friend Marky is hiding. Olivia says Marky is cheating on her boyfriend. Marky and her friend Lucas also hear this along with everyone. Lucas becomes furious and leaves from there. Marky also moves behind him. Olivia apologizes to her while holding her hand. Marky tells Olivia to leave her or she will break her hands. Olivia's friend is playing a pool game. He tries to talk to a girl. The girl is leaving, but suddenly she changes in a strange way. She asks him truth or dare. He chooses dare. The girl asks him to do the dare, but when he couldn't complete it, his face changes and he ends himself while falling from the pool table. His friends get scared seeing it. Olivia is with her friends. Olivia tries to make them understand about truth or dare. They consider it fun, but after some time, they receive the video of their friend who died from the pool table. Olivia gets panicked and surprised as well to see all this. Olivia tries to make her friend understand this. Lucas doesn't believe her and leaves. Lucas hears a voice calling him towards him. He sees a wall painting. The painting was of truth or dare. It means he has to choose one from truth or dare. Lucas considers it as a joke done by his friends. Suddenly his hands start burning. He sees that truth or dare was written on his arm. After it, he calls Olivia and tells her about it. He tells her that he always likes her. Actually, he was revealing his truth while choosing truth. After it, Lucas reaches his friends and tells them about all this. Olivia shows them the selfie and tells this game is moving with this selfie sequence. Marky was still not believing on all this. She is considering it fake. Suddenly, she receives a message on her mobile. She has to choose truth or dare. Olivia asked her to reply. Marky chooses dare while obeying her. Then she was asked to break Olivia's hand to complete the dare. Marky wasn't ready for this, but Olivia takes this serious. She insists her to forcefully break her hand with a hammer. Lucas and his friend immediately take her to the hospital. Olivia's friend goes out to get some snacks. He feels an old man behind him. The old man was dead already. When Olivia's friend turned to see there was no one, suddenly someone asks him to choose truth or dare. Olivia's friend doesn't understand anything. The old man attacks him. He holds his neck. He gets scared and says truth. As he says this, the man disappears. Meanwhile, an officer arrives who is talking normally. Suddenly, his face changes and he asks Olivia's friend to tell the truth that he has chosen. Olivia's friend comes to his friends and tells them what happened to him. He tells the game, forced me to tell my father the truth that I am not a good boy. Olivia's friend is feeling good after telling all this. He was happy and they discovered the next turn as of their male friend while seeing the selfie. They message him after seeing it. He was in an interview, so he ignores their messages. His friends reached there when he was in the interview. 
We see their friend is coming out, but then he remembers he has forgotten his bag inside. He moves to the cabin for bringing his bag. The lady closes the door, meanwhile her face changes. She asks Olivia's friend to choose truth or dare. He chooses truth, but when he didn't tell the truth, his face also changes. He hurts his eye with the pen while stabbing it. He dies badly. His friends get scared seeing this. When they reach home, Marky says Carter has started all this, and he is the one who can end all this. Olivia tries to search him online, but it was useless. Marky searches for truth or dare and discovers Geisel. She finds the video clip in which she burnt the girl. A girl reaches a gas station in the car. She asks for some stuff from the store owner. The store owner asks her truth or dare. Hearing this, the girl starts weeping. She says, I don't want to play this game. Due to it, Geisel sets a girl on fire. She apologizes her while doing this. The girl dies because of being burnt. They start checking Geisel's profile. They find Carter in her selfie. They text Geisel while making a fake account. They ask her to meet as the police are also in search of her. Olivia's female friend asked to choose truth or dare. She chooses truth. The game forbids her and says this game doesn't work like this. If two people have chosen truth, the next person must have to choose dare. Marky asks everyone to go out of the house to check. They discover their friend got a dare forcefully. The dare is that she has to move around the roof until the bottle finishes. They try to save their friend. They walk with her while lifting a mattress, so she will fall on the mattress and she will not get any harm. There was a gate on the way having sharp rods on it. Olivia breaks the door with the help of the car. Their friend is about to fall on the car. They place the mattress on the car. She escapes death because she falls on the mattress. Olivia receives Jaisal's message. She's calling them to meet. They go to meet her. Meanwhile, Jaisal arrives to them. She was scared. When they ask her about Carter, she says he is our friend. The game has given her the dare to trap others in the game. That's why he was compelled to do this and trapped you. During this, Jaisal apologizes to Olivia and takes her name. Olivia gets scared and surprised because she didn't tell her name. Jaisal tries to shoot Olivia for ending her, but Olivia's friends catches her. Actually, Jaisal got the dare to end Olivia. Now because of not completing her dare, her face changes. She ends herself by shooting and they become astonished to see this. They get scared. Olivia reaches a detective with her friends. She tells him everything about how her friends died because of this game truth or dare. The detective forbids them to go out of the city after hearing this. The game gives dare to Marky's friend to live with Olivia. Marky becomes furious hearing this and leaves from there. Later, Olivia and Lucas move to complete their dare. Lucas search online and finds an old survivor. She was a nun and somehow escaped from this game. They go to her home for meeting her. They discover that she doesn't talk to anyone because she can't speak. They request her and tell their problem. The lady tells them the mission of the game by writing it. They discover someone has called a demon through this game. This game has been possessed by the demon. It can even possess people's locations and even people's ideas. This lady and her friends were the first who played this game. This demon has made her end a priest. The lady tells the person who releases the demon is the one who can imprison. The lady gives them a spell to read on the demon seven times and gives them a soil pot. Seeing the pot, Olivia remembers they have seen this pot in the church. It was broken. The lady tells them they have to sacrifice their tongue while saying the spells. Due to this, the demon will be again imprisoned in this soil pot. The lady also can't speak because she also has sacrificed her tongue. They have no idea who has broken that soil pot with which the demon was released. Olivia remembers Jaisal has told them about a girl. She thinks that maybe she has broken this soil pot and released the demon. During this, the officer arrives and takes Olivia's friend with him for talking to him. Olivia calls Marky and discover Marky and Lucas both have chosen truth. That's why the next is the turn of their friend. The game gives him the dare to compel the officer to beg for his life. When he tries to do this while taking out his gun, another officer reaches and ends him. Olivia and Lucas arrive and get scared to see this. They reach Marky, and the game asks Olivia to choose truth or dare. Olivia chooses truth, and the game asks Olivia to tell the secret to Marky she has hidden until now. She gets scared to hear this. She reveals her secret in front of Marky. She tells she was with her father when he took his life. She knows what happened there. She tells that she went to her home after getting angry with her parents. Marky's father misbehaved with Olivia because he was drunk. He couldn't bear this when he came into his sense, so he ended himself. Marky becomes depressed after knowing this and leaves from there. 
Olivia goes to the detective where she discovers only four people left from this game. There are Olivia, Marky, Lucas, and one of Jaisal's friend. He is still there and Olivia becomes surprised to hear the name of Jaisal's friend. Detective shows him his picture. He was none other than Carter. Olivia asks about him from the detective and discovers he is living in an apartment. Jaisal lied to them because she wants to save her friend. Olivia goes to her friend and finds her ending herself. Olivia stops her while telling her about Carter. They reach his apartment and he gets scared to see them. He got disappointed and lost his courage. Olivia says, don't be worried, we can escape. She tells him that he is the one who can end this game. Carter thinks maybe they are lying to him. He starts beating them. Olivia takes him at the gunpoint and warns him to shoot. Carter gets ready to move with them. They reach the church. Olivia asks him to read those spells seven times. The game gives a dare to Lucas to end one of them. He doesn't want this, so he moves far from the... Carter reads those spells seven times and Olivia asks him to cut his tongue. Carter refuses to do this, but Olivia warns him to end him by shooting him. She makes him understand if he wants to stay alive, he has to do this. Lucas failed to complete his dare, so the game demon took possession of him. He tries to end him. When Carter was cutting his tongue, Lucas holds him. He ends him later, he cuts his neck and dies there. Olivia and Marky also become depressed because their best friend also died as well. The game asks Marky to choose truth or dare. Marky chooses dare. Marky chooses. The demon asks Marky to shoot Olivia with the gun. Unwillingly, Marky shoots at her shoulder and she was possessed. Olivia says you are now a part of this game because you are in Marky's body right now. She asks it to choose truth or dare. The demon chooses truth. Olivia asks how can we escape alive from this game. The demon says now you can't escape because only Carter can do this. He is dead now, so you have only a way to trap the people in the game and compel them to play this game. Olivia and Marky escape. Olivia tells Veryone about the game through her YouTube channel. Due to it, the people who watched the video are now a part of this game. Ray watches the guards while burning a page from his Bible. He's using the ashes to draw on the wall. At that moment, his cellmate informs him that a prisoner is planning to attack Ray in the yard. Next day, Ray attacks first and quickly overpowers two other prisoners, fighting like a pro and severely injuring them in the process. The guards immediately capture Ray. They take him to solitary confinement. He is allowed to keep his Bible. As days pass, Ray studies the guards' routines, like their smoking breaks and the use of a keypad lock. Ray also starts making little balls with toilet paper and water. He hides that ball inside the toilet paper tube. When they bring him lunch, he extracts a transparent plastic sheet from the milk carton. One afternoon, Ray asks a guard for the time, then he starts counting for himself. A mysterious woman leaves a car in the prison's parking lot. She walks away from it. She uses a control to make it explode. All the guards run to evacuate the prisoners, only to discover that Ray has escaped. The fire truck rushes to take care of the fire. Ray is on it dressed as a fireman. He escaped in a vehicle driven by his friends Hush and Abigail, who triggered the explosion. They drop Ray at a store by the road and give him a coin. Ray uses to call a certain number and just say the word, Showtime. Soon, Ray is surrounded by policemen. They arrested him again. He isn't bothered because his manager, Lester, is already taking care of it. Lester explains that he and Ray work for a company hired by the government to break out of prisons and expose the flaws in their security systems. Ray has already escaped from 14 prisons and explains how he did this time. He studied the layout and the routines of the guard. He made some enemies on purpose to be sent to solitary confinement. He noticed the prison is understaffed. He was left alone whenever the guards left to smoke. He wrote a letter for his team, hiding the chosen day to escape in code. He also put the plastic sheet on the keypad to get the guards' fingerprints and retrieved it by hiding it in his Bible. The sheet gave him the four numbers. He just had to guess the sequence. He used the paper ball on the door's food hatch to stop it from locking properly. When the guards weren't around, he put his hand out to test combinations until it worked. While the guards were out smoking, Ray came out, rewound the security cameras a few hours to cover his absence. He used the vents to reach the fire apartment right before Abigail started the fire. Now the warden is annoyed, but lets Ray go. Sometime later in Los Angeles, Ray helps Hush with some computer problems before meeting CIA representative Jessica. She has a job offer. She explains that the CIA has created a new prison whose location can't be shared with Ray or his team. If he manages to escape from it, they'll pay $5 million instead of the usual 2.5. Ray agrees to do it, 
Even if Abigail and Hush are wary, Jessica provides Ray with a cover ID, an explosives terrorist named Portos. His contact in the prison will be Warden Marsh, and Ray is given an evacuation code. Abigail and Hush are still worried about the lack of information they have on this prison and convince Ray to wear a tracking device. They inject the device into his arm. Then Ray goes to stand on the street to be picked up. Suddenly, he gets teased down and thrown into the back of a van. While the vehicle takes off, the masked men scan Ray's body and find the tracker. They immediately take it out. Abigail's and Hush's computer instantly loses Ray's signal. Ray is put to sleep with an injection. Sometime later, Ray wakes up inside a helicopter while still in a groggy state. He watches a guard beats another inmate up before stabbing him and throwing him out of the helicopter. Then Drake notices Ray is awake and orders his men to put him to sleep again. When Ray wakes up again, he's finally in prison. It's nothing like he's ever seen before. All cells are plexiglass cubes hanging in the air, and guards wear black masks to hide their identities. There's also a huge sphere with a camera that moves around to keep an eye on the prisoners. Ray is taken to see the warden. He is a man called Hobbs. Ray become worried because this isn't the warden they told him about. Ray gives out his evacuation code. Hobbs doesn't know what he means and doesn't care. Later, everyone is taken out of their cells for a break. Ray watches how the guards don't hesitate to brutally beat up anyone who doesn't obey them. The prisoners' jumpsuits have a special code on them. They get scanned through every door. At that moment, Hobbs says the name of Ray's fake identity through the speakers. After watching another man getting beat up, Ray is approached by some thugs who want to take advantage of the new guy. Ray immediately breaks the leader's hand and punches him down. Before the others can react, prisoner Emil tells them to back away. Emil tries to befriend Ray and explains he used to work for Mannheim, a powerful man who stole from the rich to give to the poor. Mannheim is a wanted man, but Emil refuses to tell Hobbs anything. However, Ray doesn't care about Emil's story. Meanwhile, Hobbs scolds Drake for killing that inmate since it was a capture for a client. Many people here aren't criminals, and they just got on someone's bad side. Ray continues to study the layout of the prison and the behavior of the inmates. He notices the Muslim prisoners that still pray even if they can't see the sunset. Emil notices Ray watches everything and points out he's the guy to go for favors. Ray explains he needs to get into the isolation area. Eager to help, Emil immediately punches him and makes him fall. Ray punches back. Emil just laughs. Ray starts hitting him harder and an actual fight ensues until the guards come to drag Ray and Emil to the isolation area. The isolation rooms are tiny metal boxes with blinding lights on the side, which torture the prisoners with unbearable heat. Ray does his best to withstand the suffering and inspects the box for anything he can use to escape. Dr. Kairi comes to check on Ray's health, and Ray tries to get information from him. Kiri doesn't say anything. On his way out, Kiri is approached by Drake, who demands to know what they talked about. He lies which tells Ray he may have a conscience after all. Emil and Ray are sent back to the general area. Ray starts making a drawing on the table while telling Emil he'll need a piece of metal. Emil asks to speak to Hobbs and pretends he'll finally confess Mannheim's location. He asks for some paper to draw a map. He makes a very rude drawing instead. Hobbs gets furious and told his men to hold Emil down. After enduring lots of pain, Emil uses the chance to steal a metal drain cover. Later in the common area, Emil gives the cover to Ray, who tells him his real identity and how he got there. Ray guesses this prison has been built underground, and there's something under the box's hatch that should allow him to escape. The place is subterranean. There's moisture in the air that has caused the steel rivets to rust. Ray will apply toothpaste and heat with the metal cover to make the rivets snap. First, they need to be sent to the isolation again. Emil approaches Javed and starts a fight by insulting his mother. Javed's Muslim group comes in his defense. After hiding some bread in his clothes, Ray joins the fight. They only get to exchange a few hits before the guards arrive. They subdue everyone with tasers. Once everyone is back in the heat boxes, Ray starts working on the rivets while hiding what he's doing with his own body. It's very hard to work because of the heat. Emil hides it by yelling about his pain. Eventually, Ray manages to remove all the rivets and covers the security camera with the bread. He knock on the wall to give Emil a signal. At that moment, Emil begins to cry and yell like crazy. He gets the guard's attention on him. Ray uses the chance to finally open the hatch. He begins to go down a ladder until he lands on a corridor. The door is locked, so he decides to use some pipes to start climbing up. He accidentally tear off some electrical cables. He also break few pipes in the process. Ray just keeps going until he finds another hatch. He opens it to find the shocking truth. This prison is inside an oil tanker ship in the middle of the ocean. Suddenly, he notices some guards nearby. 
so he quickly hides and goes back into the hatch to climb down. Leaking water pushes him away and he ends up falling, but the corridor is getting flooded so he lands safely in the water. As the boxes slowly get flooded too, an alarm starts ringing. The guards rush to take the prisoners out of isolation. Ray swims as fast as he can, and after lots of effort to go against the water pressure on the stairs, he returns to his box right before the guards come for him. Abigail and Hush inform Lester that Jessica's check has been bounced. Lester tells them that he's already talked to her and everything is going well. After the water is taken care of, Hobbs finds the rivets in Ray's box and starts getting suspicious. He makes a call that reveals Lester has been in contact with him all along. Lester tells Hobbs about Ray's real identity. Lester asks him to keep Ray forever. He asks Hobbs for information on Mannheim because banks all over the world want his head. Ray is trying to sleep but a guard keeps tapping on his wall to keep him awake. The guard beats him up in the morning as a wake-up call. This starts happening every day. Ray's body begins getting so weak that he can barely move. Emil gives him as many pep talks as possible to keep up Ray's spirit. Ray ends up sharing his story. He used to be a prosecutor. A criminal he sent to jail escaped and kill Ray's family for revenge. The drawing Ray is making is the last memory of his kid. Since then, he makes sure criminals won't escape ever again. For the next few days, Ray studies the guards' routine to find any useful habits. He starts to assign names to them by differencing them through body shapes. To start making a plan, he first needs to know where they are. There were no landmarks when he went out. One day during lunch, Emil discreetly stabs Ray. He's taken to Kiri's office for stitches. Ray suddenly pretends that he's in great pain and falls. He used the chance to steal a few things from a tray. He also reminds Kiri of his oath, but the doctor still ignores his questions. When Ray returns to the common area, Emil gives him a pen and a prisoner's glasses. Hiding his hands under the table, Ray builds a sextant, which should help them determine where they're based on the stars. Drake and Hobbs notice weird movements on the security camera, so Hobbs asks to see Ray. Fortunately, he hides the tool before he's dragged away to a new section. Hobbs tells him he knows his identity and admits he used his book to design this facility. Then Ray is sent back to the common area and tells Emil about the new plan. Later, while Ray is giving a bunch of fake information to Hobbs, Emil approaches Javed and gives him the sextant. He promised to help him escape too if he helps them. Afterward, Javed contacts Hobbs and tells him the others are planning to escape. Hobbs agrees to buy his information by letting him pray in open air as his beliefs demand. This is all part of the plan. That night in his new cell, Javed uses the sextant to get the coordinates of their location. The next day over lunch, Javed gives his notes to Ray. He puts it together with things like the weather he felt when he was out, the date mentioned by a newbie, and the direction the water goes down in the toilet. Ray concludes that they're near the coast of Morocco. Ray swallows some clothing powder to get sick. He's sent to Kyrie's office. He tells the doctor to go to Hobbs's office and read a passage on a particular page in a certain book. After some hesitation, Kiri checks the book and finds the Hippocratic Oath. The next day, Kiri asks the guards to bring Ray to his office for a checkup. He wonders how Kiri knew the exact page, and Ray explains he wrote it, which confirms his identity. He finally convinces Kyrie to help. Afterward, Ray gives Hobbs a fake location to find Mannheim. They have 24 hours to escape before Hobbs catches on. As part of the plan, Javed also meets with Hobbs and tells him about the incoming escape. Hobbs rushes to check the cameras and notices Ray tapping on his cell wall. Recognizing Morse code, they discover a message about a plan to riot in Block C during transfer. Meanwhile, Kiri is sending a coded email to request help. After most of the guards are sent to Block C, Javed starts a riot in the common area. It soon becomes absolute chaos. Hobbs tries to make his men change areas quickly. Ray, Emil, and Javed rush to knock down the few guards around them and steal their weapons. The incoming guards start subduing the prisoners. They throw a gas bomb, allowing the trio to sneak away unnoticed. Ray explains that they only have 11 minutes to meet with the rescuers, who are approaching in a helicopter. They rush upstairs and shoot a door open. Ray finds a security camera, since the cameras are connected. Ray messes with this one to disable them all. At that moment, Hobbs activates lockdown protocol. When the trio is about to get out, they find the exit is locked. The trio starts wandering around looking for another exit. Soon they're surrounded by guards who open fire. They immediately shoot back and quickly bring down all the men. Javed gets wounded in the process. More guards are coming. Emil and Ray drag Javed as they run to hide behind another door. Ray realizes they were found by a motion detector, so he disables it. Hobbs taunts him through the speakers. Ray decides he must find the engine room to shut down the power. He gives his gun to Javed and tells him and Emil to take the stairs. After Ray leaves, Javed admits he won't make it. He takes Emil's gun too, 
and asks him to go on without him. Soon after Emil leaves, Javed is surrounded by guards, bravely makes sure to shoot all of them down. He's brought down by a hidden shooter. When Hobbs finds him, Javed says his last words to his before he's killed. Meanwhile, Drake goes after Ray in the engine room. Ray jumps around and runs to dodge Drake's bullets. He manages to surprise him from behind. In the struggle, Drake loses his gun, takes out a knife, and a hand-to-hand -hand fight ensues. After exchanging a few hits, Drake chokes Ray for a few seconds. He starts to kick him down. Ray grabs his leg to overpower him and get the fighting going again. Both men steal a few tools to use as weapons. After exchanging a few hits, Ray pushes Drake down the stairs and kills him. Ray rushes to the control panel. He knocks out the technician and turns off the ship's generators. All lights go out in the ship and the doors open allowing Emil to come out. At that moment, a helicopter opens fire on the ship before landing on the deck. Few men come out to start a gunfight with the guards. Emil sneaks around while avoiding bullets and makes it to the chopper. One of the soldiers has been shot down. The pilot wants to take off, but Emil asks him to wait for Ray. He takes over a machine gun to join the fight. He kills dozens of guards in seconds. In the engine room, Hobbs is looking for Ray, who is hiding inside a water tank. At that moment, the guards turn the ship's systems back on. Emil has no choice but to leave with his guys in the helicopter. Ray's tank starts filling with water, but before he gets drowned, the tank automatically flushes itself and expels Ray into the ocean. He immediately swims to the surface. Emil throws a ladder down for him. He climbs up. Hobbs and the guards open fire on them. Emil gives Ray a gun, and they both fire back until Emil gets wounded in the shoulder. Hobbs keeps missing his moving target. Ray uses the chance to shoot a bunch of oil tanks, causing a big explosion that kills Hobbs. The helicopter drops the duo on the Moroccan beach, where they're picked up by Jessica. It turns out that Emil is Mannheim, and Jessica is his daughter. She hired Ray to get her dad out of prison. She also confirms that Lester is doing dirty and betrayed her too. Sometime later, Ray reunites with Abigail, who has acquired information on Lester. He had been offered to be CEO of the prison program if Ray was unable to get out. Now Lester is trying to get away, but Hush is waiting for him in his car and quickly knocks him out. When Lester wakes up, he discovers his car is inside a container on top of a ship in the middle of the ocean. A boy named Jay is living happily with his family. His family consists of his wife and two younger daughters. He was going abroad for work for a few days. His wife is upset by this and became depressed. He assures his wife that he will return soon and that they will go for a vacation. Meanwhile, a stranger was watching inside the window. Jay hears someone walking outside the house. He realizes someone's presence. He ignores it. After a while, he sees the main door of the house is open. It was closed before. He understands that there is someone in the house. He hears his wife screaming. When he runs to the kitchen, he finds his wife unconscious, and she was bleeding. He panics and moves to bring his daughter who was hiding under the bed. The girl was scared. Jay asks her to come out. He moving his hand forward, but the stranger comes and makes Jay unconscious. When Jay awakes, his face was covered with a cloth. He removes it and finds himself in a huge basement. There was a handcuff in his hand that means the stranger brought him here while kidnapping him. He isn't alone here, he is with three more persons who are also trapped here like him. There was a girl, a security guard, and a man who was badly injured. These four don't know each other. Kidnapper removed the skin of his body and stitched his mouth. The kidnapper trying to make him silent. Maybe he has recognized him. He is in critical condition with his body bleeding and his mouth stitched shut, preventing him from speaking or moving. He was just lying in a corner, scared as a living corpse. Jay asked that boy and the security guard who the kidnapper would be. Why did he kidnap them and keep them here while imprisoning them? They also don't know anything about it. The kidnapper wants to torture them. Jay screams and says, he is a good human and haven't done anything wrong in his life to be punished. After a few hours, the light blinks, signaling the arrival of the kidnapper. The kidnapper arrives and throws a piece of meat from a small path for them to eat. The girl picks it up hurriedly and divides it. She then throws it towards the Jay. Jay forbids eating the piece of meat because he is a vegan. She says that they only get this to eat now. The injured man can't eat anything, so the kidnapper gives him injections to keep him alive. Jay starts using his mind because he wants to escape somehow. The girl and guard are silently sitting there. They didn't try to escape as they have done many tries to escape from there, but failed. They lost their courage and get hopeless. Jay starts scratching the wall. During this, his nail exfoliate, due to which he suffers from pain. He understands there is only one way to escape from here and that is the main door. Except for this, he tries to scratch the ground and finds a bone and a skeleton. He sees a camera. The kidnapper is enjoying while seeing them in pain. Jay starts abusing the kidnapper seeing in the camera. He says ill about him. The guard tries to forbid him. He tells him if the kidnapper becomes furious, 
it will not be good for them. Jay ignores him and continuously says ill to the kidnapper. Finally, the kidnapper becomes furious. He immediately comes there kidnapper known as Dominic. Jay was thinking of running from here after beating the kidnapper. His condition get worse when he sees Dominic. He lost his words as he was a strong and powerful man. He was wearing a leather mask to hide his face. It looked like someone's skin. Jay was scared but courageously asked Dominic where his family is. Are they all right or have he done something to them? He doesn't answer him and just staring at him silently. After it, he brings the injured man in the middle of the room. He gives his knife to the girl and compels her to cut that injured man's skin from belly and give it to him. She has no other way. She does the same as he say. The boy was already injured. She cuts his skin and gives it to Dominic. He sends her back. After it, he throws the knife to Jay. He asks him to do the same. He picks up the knife and attacks Dominic. He moves away at the right time so doesn't get injured. Jay failed in his attack, and now it wasn't good for him. Dominic attacks him with his elbow. Because of Jay's act, he will punish that girl. He holds her face and calls the guard. He asks him to put a pipe in her mouth. He puts an insect along with a blade in her mouth and then shuts her mouth. The insect gets stuck in the girl's throat. She is suffering from pain and feeling problems while breathing. After a while, her mouth starts bleeding in which the insect comes out. Jay keeps the blade while crushing the insect. He tried to cut his rope with that blade. The guard was still forbidding him to do this. Otherwise, the next time they will get the worst punishment. Jay doesn't listen to him and cuts his hand rope. Jay moves out of this room while pushing Dominic when he arrives. Unluckily, all the doors to go out of this house were closed. He couldn't leave from there. He gets into an AC vent, but it breaks because of his weight, as it was a narrow place. Jay falls down and gets faint. When he awakes, he finds himself at the place where he was tied before. This time, Dominic has chained his hands. Dominic again moves inside to punish Jay for what he has done. He gives a key to the guard and opens his handcuffs. Then he gives him a hammer and two nails. He makes him understand to drive nails in his hands so that he can't leave from here. The guard follow his orders and drives nails into Jay's hands. It was terrible and painful causing Jay to faint again. He awakes and sees his hands were bound in the wall through nails. It was giving him a lot of pain. He bears pain and somehow releases his hands from nails. He takes a calm breath. After a while, he says that there must be some connection between them and kidnapper Dominic. That's why he is torturing, and in this, he has crossed all limits of cruelty. They don't remember anything about it. What is the connection between them and what wrong had they done to him? The injured man tries to say something. He makes a mark on sand with his finger. After it, he opens the stitches of his mouth. While bearing pain tearing his mouth, he just says a word horseshoe. As he was injured and after bearing a lot of pain, he dies. Hearing this word, Horseshoe Jay becomes astonished. He understands the relation with the kidnapper. 20 years ago, when Jay goes on vacation with his family as a child, it was like forest, and here he makes three friends. They are none other than the same who are locked with him in the basement. The girl, the guard, and the injured man. Jay tells them a true story that there is a farmhouse in this forest. The farmer lives there and his wife died few times ago. Since then, he has become insane. He imprisoned his son in his farmhouse and tortured him even after he removed his skin. One day, he killed his son with a sharp axe. It is said that the farmer is still alive and lives in his farmhouse. That farmhouse is in this forest, and the farmer is wandering in this forest for his next prey. The kids don't believe Jay's story, and a boy, Dominic, comes to them. He tells them that he also come here to spend vacations with his family. He wants to make friendship with them. They don't make him their friend, and think to enjoy while teasing him. They say if he wants to join our group, he has to complete few dares. He has to do what the will ask him to do. Dominic agrees. The girl firstly asks Dominic to keep an insect in his mouth. Jay's friend, who is a guard in present, puts hand on his mouth. Due to this, Dominic has to swallow that insect. Later, the girl leaves a spider on Dominic's head. The spider moves on his face, bites him while moving in his ear. He feels pain. He runs from there while screaming. They were still behind him and hold him later. He was tied with the rope, and Jay friend leaves a lot of insects on his face. He can't do anything. They were so evil that they left him there. They warned him to take care if any insect will move in his eyes, otherwise it will eat his brain. Next day, Dominic returns. His parents were fighting. He becomes fed up and comes out of the van. Meanwhile, the girl arrives and sits with him. She sees a mark on Dominic's hand. That was of a horseshoe. Dominic has made it at the time when his parents saw his favorite horse. After it, Jay's friend takes him to the old farmhouse the farmhouse where the insane farmer lives. Meanwhile, the other friends of the girl arrive. They ask Dominic to go inside this farmhouse. They will let him join the group if he dare to do this. Dominic moves aside the farmhouse. They run and leave him there. While leaving, they saw someone in the farmhouse and he holds Dominic. After that, they moved to their home and never met again. They came face to face today. That's why they didn't recognize each other. The boy Dominic also disappeared and never returned home. They didn't help him when the police investigated them. They didn't tell the police about Dominic or the farmer and his farmhouse. 
The insane farmer lived in the farmhouse in real life. He kept Dominic with him. He considered him his son, and Starts brought him up. The farmer put in his mind that his parents and friends are not good persons as they leave him alone. He started to grow him as his son. Whenever Dominic tried to escape, the farmer punished him by torturing him. He taught him that if he want to erase bad things from any person, he should torture him. By doing this, he can remove bad habit from that person. There is a room in the farmhouse where it is not allowed for Dominic to go. One day, he entered that room. He found that the farmer had lost his mental balance. He is not in his senses, and due to his madness, he killed his son. He also found out that the farmer fired up the van of his parents, so no one can find the Dominic. Farmer reached there and starts beating Dominic. He knows that after finding out all the secrets, Dominic will never consider him his dad again. He ties up him with a rope, and Triesto end him by putting him in hot boiling water. Dominic somehow manages to escape. He then did same with the farmer and ended his life by putting him into that boiling water. After this, Dominic made the mask from the dead farmer's skin and start to wear it. Jay tells his friend that they all should apologize from Dominic. None of them agree to that. Jay starts to shout Dominic name. Dominic comes to the room. He does the same and puts the insect in his eye. He also cut his eye so insects can get into that. After it, he leaves, but this time he forgets his knife. Jay opens his friend and his handcuffs with that knife. He separates his friend's eye from his body because the insect was biting on his injured eye. Jay's friend tells him to give that knife so that he can save himself while fighting with Dominic. Jay clearly refused to give the knife. There's a fight happens between them because of the knife. To stop this fight, the girl hits stone at guard's head. The knife stabs in his mouth, and because of this, he dies on the spot. The girl points the knife at Jay and says there is their fault in all this because they left him in that farmhouse. Then Dominic arrives and holds the girl. Jay apologized to him for what they have done. He tells him that they know they done wrong with him, but they fell guilty no and accept their mistakes. Dominic traps by his words. Jay removes his mask and then takes the knife from his hand. Dominic doesn't stop and tries to kill the girl while pressing her neck. Jay tries to attack him with a knife. Dominic turns and the knife stabs in the girl and many spiders come out of her mouth. Dominic kills the girl while tearing her body apart with the knife. Jay is the only survivor, so he escapes while getting a chance. He doesn't find the exit way of the farmhouse. Meanwhile, Dominic arrives and beats him badly while holding him. He tries to kill Jay while drowning him in the water. Jay releases himself and attacks his face with a handle repeatedly. He finally comes out of the farmhouse. Dominic is still chasing him. They reached the forest. He holds Jay and tries to kill him while pressing his neck. Jay stabs a knife in Dominic that he took secretly. Due to this, he dies. Jay moves to the nearby police station, and the police drops him at his home. His family was waiting for him. He becomes happy. Jay's daughters have grown elder, and they come with their friends in that forest on vacations. The police didn't find Dominic's dead body. He is alive. A group of friends sitting around a table at a house party. The girls talk about an app. The others asks about it. She reads the description and tells that this app can tell you exactly when you're going to die. All of them except Courtney want to make a drinking game out of it. They decide that the one with the least to live will drink everything that's on the table. Courtney reluctantly does it too and accepts the terms and conditions. Everyone gets around 40 to 20 years of life. Courtney looks upset. She shows them that she only has three hours to live. The rest make fun of her. They tell her that she has to abide by the rules of the game and drink. Her boyfriend Evan comes over. He drinks instead of her. Later, the two of them are going over to his car. He's visibly drunk. When they enter, she asks him to walk her to her house. She do not want to drive to home. She gets out and starts walking. He tries to convince her to come back in. When he doesn't succeed, he dives off angrily. Courtney gets a message from the app saying she's broken the user agreement. She continues to walk. It looks like somebody is following her. The app says she has less than two minutes to live. She runs to her house as the app continues to blare on her phone. She powers it off. Courtney walks into the bathroom. She becomes increasingly paranoid, so she checks the shower curtain. She goes to drink some water. The curtains move again. She turns around, but something grabs her from above and drops her on the shower, breaking her head. She dies when the countdown timer runs down to zero. Meanwhile, Evan was in a car accident. The passenger seat where Courtney was supposed to be is completely trashed. Quinn walks into the room, discovering that Evan in Naughton room. She knows where to find him. He's sitting on a balcony in a closed wing of the hospital. She sits with him and tries to make small talk to relax him for surgery. He shows her the countdown app, which says that he's only around 19 hours left. He tells her about the app and his girlfriend convinced that it knew when she was going to die. Evan thinks that the app also knows that he will die during his surgery. Quinn tells him not to worry about the app and makes him come back to his room. 
Quinn tells her friends about the app, and some of the others have already heard about it. They laugh about it. Scott gets more than 50 years to live, and so does Dr. Sullivan. Suddenly, a man walks in carrying a woman that's overdosing. The doctor checks her right there on the floor. Amy tells Quinn to bring the kit with the drugs to counteract what she's taken. Amy administers it to the woman, and she wakes up. Quinn is leaving work. She gets an ad for the app. She downloads it and enters her information agreeing to the terms. The app tells her that she has little over two days to live. Suddenly, Dr. Sullivan walks into the elevator and flirts with her. She tries to let him off easy. That night, Quinn is at home finishing her nursing documents. She runs into a problem. She'll need to enter the information from her birth certificate. Quinn doesn't have it with her. She goes to get it from her parents' house. She sifts through her mom's papers and finds it on the bottom of the pile. Something moves in the closet behind her. When she opens it, she finds her sister Jordan there along with her boyfriend. Quinn scolds her sister about it. Jordan is angry with her for parenting her and not coming over to see her more often after their mom died. Quinn goes to her room to apologize. Her father wakes and comes to greet her. He's happy to see Quinn and asks her if she wants to come with them to visit her mom's grave. The next day, Evan is preparing for his surgery. He sees that he has around three minutes to live. He leaves the room and the app pushes a notification on his phone telling him he's broken the agreement. Evan sees a deathly figure behind him in the mirror no one's there. He escapes to the stairwell. The app continues to notify him of the countdown. Evan can't get out of the dark stairwell. He hears footsteps inside the stairwell. He uses the light on his phone but can't see anyone downstairs. Evan looks up and thinks he sees Courtney, but it's something else. It's coming after him. His phone drops down the stairs. When the countdown reaches zero, he falls down. Later, Quinn comes to work and Amy informs her about Evan. She remembers the app and seems disturbed. Quinn goes to his room. She sees her colleague packing it up. She tells her that she'll take over. She finds his phone and realizing she needs his fingerprint to open it. She goes to see his body in the basement facility. Quinn tries to open his phone with his thumb, but it doesn't work. She tries again with his face. She opens his eyes and manages to open the phone finally, only to see the countdown has reached zero. Suddenly, his hand falls and touches her. She drops the phone. When she picks it up, his head is turned and he's looking at her. She puts the body back inside the freezer. Quinn checks her phone to see that she has less than two days to live in. The countdown time is at the same hour when she'll meet her father and sister at her mother's grave. She calls her dad and cancels their plan. The app sends her a notification that she's broken the user agreement. She notices a figure in the room she passes. She comes back and no one's there. Suddenly, Dr. Sullivan scares her. He asks her to help with a patient, but she has trouble with a machine. She wants to leave. He stops her trying to awkwardly comfort her. The doctor makes another advance on her and she declines. He keeps going when she pushes him off. She goes to find Nurse Amy and tell her about what's happened. Before she can say anything, the doctor calls for Amy. She doesn't get to tell her. The app flashes another notification. Quinn tries to delete the app, but can't. She searches for it online and finds information about Courtney. She watches a video from a girl ranting about the app. She tells that she's seeing things like her dead cousins. Suddenly, the girl says her time is up. Then she sees something screams and drops her phone. The comments under the video say it's a fake. So Quinn relaxes a little bit and shuts her laptop. Suddenly, she sees dead Evan. Her phone pushes another notification, so she breaks it, but it still shows the countdown. Quinn gets in her car and falls asleep there. Jordan wakes her up in the morning. The two of them go up to her apartment. Her sister finds her smashed up phone. Quinn tells her she only has one more day to live. She jokes with her when she figures out the app. Jordan asks to stay with her because their dad went on a last minute work trip. When Quinn refuses, Jordan storms out. The app beeps again and she scratches her finger on the broken screen. Later, she's in a shop buying a new phone. She gets a completely new phone and SIM card. She checks if the app is there. She doesn't see it. She goes to leave, but another notification arrives. The app is on the new phone as well. She asks the guy about the app. He tries to delete it, but can't. When she finally leaves, one of the other customers asks the store guy about the app. Quinn is in her car checking the app, which has continued to count down. Suddenly, she sees a deathly figure in her back camera. Suddenly, it grabs her from the back seat. She rams into another car, falling out of her own. The guy from the other car screams at her. The customer from the store walks out and tells him to stop. He scares him away, shows her that he also has the app. They decide to find a way to see the user agreement for the app again. Matt tells the crazy guy in the bar to download it. Quinn starts reading terms. It says that they have to accept their fate. The crazy guy still agrees to the terms. The app tells him that he'll live to 91. Quinn and Matt go to the hospital and speak to the priest. 
They ask him about demons. He says that he doesn't believe in them and sends them to someone else. Matt goes to the restroom. He sees a barefoot child under the door. He's washing his hands. Matt hears someone crying in one of the stalls. When he goes to check, he sees the barefoot kid again walking through the stalls like there's nothing in between. It stops at the last stall. Something appears behind him and calls his name. It attacks Matt, and when the lights come back on, it isn't there anymore. Amy takes Quinn to a meeting with HR and Dr. Sullivan. He says that she was the one to corner him. The man from HR says that she'll get suspended. Quinn starts explaining her side of the story. Amy confronts her, but Quinn storms out. Matt is waiting for her. He doesn't tell her what's happened. They walk into a church looking for the priest. They ask him about demons. He immediately thinks of an ancient story. The priest tells them that a prince gets a scroll from an old gypsy woman for telling the exact hour in which he would die. She heeds him a warning that he must not use the information to alter his fate. The prince still does and goes back to the gypsy telling her that death is after him. She tells him that it's not death, but a demon. The demon will torture him until the moment he dies. He tells them to find someone to hack the app for them. They go to the store guy, Derek, for help. They bribe him to help them. He knows the app and makes fun of them for believing it, but he still hacks it for them. The code for the app is in Latin. They also find the countdowns for all the people using the app inside the code, including Derek's. He changes all the parameters for his countdown. When they are looking for Quinn, they find her sister's countdown too. Her clock is almost the same as her, so Derek changes it. Jordan sees the change on her phone. Matt and Quinn thanked Derek for changing their countdowns. Quinn asks Matt to stay with her. They are getting ready for bed and even leave the lights on. They are still sacred. Matt tells her a story about his dead brother, and she tells him about her mom. They were both bad to them before they died. The lights go out. Quinn hears something in front of the room and tries to wake Matt up. The demon is the one in bed with her. When the real Matt takes off her covers, the demon disappears. The app goes back to their original countdown. Jordan hears her phone ring. She sees that her countdown has changes. When something appears in front of her room, Jordan goes to check it out. The lights go out again. She goes back into her room and closes the door. She hides under her bed and hears her mom calling to her asking for her sister. Something pushes her bed aside and suddenly, her dead mother appears. Jordan runs to the front door. Quinn and Matt are there. They go to see the demon priest again. He reads the code in Latin for them. It's a curse that he can find a way to break and lift from them. He thinks that if they can keep one of them alive longer than what the app says, the curse will be broken. His plan is to hide in a blessed circle of salt long enough to keep one of them alive so that they can lift the curse. Quinn mixes the salt with paint. The priest blesses the salt. The circle is painted on the floor. When they check Matt's countdown timer, he steps aside, panicking. The lights go out and all of them get inside the circle. The demon approaches. Priest is praying. Demon appears behind them, but it can't get inside the circle. The priest tries to vanquish it back to hell. Suddenly, a toy robot reaches the circle. Matt's brother appears and lures him out of the circle. The demon grabs him and drags him away. Quinn runs after him. When she reaches Matt, a car hits him. He dies with countdown. Jordan is hurt, so Quinn takes her to the hospital. Doctor is taking care of her sister. Quinn sees the doctor talking to her sister and goes over there. She thanks him, but has some kind of plan for him. Jordan tells Quinn that their mother's death was her fault, and not Quinn's. She goes into Dr. Sullivan's office and apologizes to him. Manipulating him, he sees right through her and asks her what she wants. She says she wants her job back and tells him to follow her into the closed wing. Moments later, the doctor walks in and looks for her around the closed wing. Quinn is playing a game with him. Suddenly, she hits him with a wrench and wants to inject him with morphine. Jordan shows up and stops her. The demon drags the doctor away. Quinn thinks that if she kills him before his countdown, it will break the curse, so she goes to find him. Jordan looks for her as her app shows her that she has less than two minutes to live. Suddenly, the demon appears behind her. Meanwhile, Quinn is still looking for the doctor. She hears something. He knocks her out and gets ready to kill her. She comes after him again. She chases him down, but the demon pushes her away. He escapes. Quinn gets another idea. Jordan is being chased by the demon. She tries to hide from it, but her app gives her position away. A freezer opens, and she goes over to investigate. The demon grabs her and throws her through a window. Her time is running out. As the demon closes in to kill her, Quinn shows up with a syringe pushed up against her skin, telling it to let her sister go. Jordan begs her not to kill herself. The demon turns into her mother, diverting her attention. Jordan's time is ticking, and Quinn is distracted for a moment. But she shoots the morphine in her veins. She dies before her time. The demon can't take her. Quinn has lifted the demon's curse. Jordan cries over her sister's dead body. She sees the name of a drug written on her arm and a bottle rolling away. She injects it into Quinn's arm and it counteracts the morphine bringing her back from the dead. Sometime later, Quinn Jordan and their father visit their mom's gravesite. As they're about to leave, Quinn gets a notification. The beta version of the countdown app has been installed on her phone.
two frightened boys run inside mansion. The older boy, Daniel, tells his brother Alex to hide in a closet. He closes the door. A wounded man named Charles begs Daniel for help. He tells the boy that someone is trying to kill him. Daniel alerts his family by shouting. A group of masked people come. Charles' bride is beginning for his life. Someone shoots a spear gun at him. Daniel keeps his back to the closet, protecting his younger brother. A woman tells Daniel that she's proud of him. Charles is taken away by the group. Helene gives up the fight, taking a deep breath, before joining the people who've taken her husband. 30 years later, Grace practices her wedding vows in front of the mirror. She enjoys a smoke to calm her nerves. Her fiance, Alex, joins her watching his family outside, joking about them. Alex believes his family is horrible, but Grace wants them to accept her. Alex's brother, Daniel, walks in to collect him. Alex sincerely tells Grace that she can still escape their family, but drops the idea and leaves. Alex offers her a chance to leave. She thinks it's a joke, assures him that she's committed to marrying him. While taking wedding photos, Alex's father, Tony, expresses disapproval over Grace and Alex's two-year disappearance. Their aunt, Helene, glares at Grace. Daniel's wife, Charity, disapproves of her. Alex's mother, Becky, sees Grace's unease and tries to lighten up her mood, saying that she got the same disapproval when she married into the family. The rest of the wedding continues without a hitch. The bride and groom walk down the aisle with bright smiles. That evening, Grace and Alex fool around in his old bedroom. Mood is interrupted by Helene watching the couple by the servant's door in the room. Helene announces that the family is waiting for them. Alex reveals the family's tradition, his family's fortune coming from board games and playing cards. That's why they play a game at midnight every time someone joins the Ladomas family. Game is chosen by drawing a card. Grace finds it odd. She is determined to win the game. Alex says to his father that he intends to take Grace away from the family the next morning. He will never tell her about their secrets. Grace explores the mansion on the way to the music room. Becky welcomes her warmly. They talk about Grace's foster family, how she had always wanted to have a permanent family. Grace reveals that Alex didn't want them to go through the wedding initially, but saw how important it is for Grace. Becky thanks Grace seeing the good she brings out on Alex. She begs Grace to convince Alex to stay with them, concerned about what his mother might say. Alex pulls Grace away. Grace notices Alex's nervousness making her worried. Alex's sister Emily, her husband Fitch, and their sons, Georgie and Gabe, arrive. Emily is ecstatic to meet Grace, but Helene interrupts the girls showing disappointment in her niece. Family enters in the game room, which is full of hunting weapons and animal displays. Here, Tony tells the story of the Le Domas gaming empire. Their great-grandfather was a merchant seaman named Victor. He was dared to solve a puzzle box by an anti-collector named Mr. LaBelle. Mr. LaBelle promised to finance any business he wanted if he won. Victor solved the box and used the money to build his gaming business. Thus, the family holds the tradition of letting the box choose a game to welcome new members to the family. Tony gave the box to Grace telling her to draw a card from it. Grace takes a card and announces the game hide and seek. Room falls silent and Alex looks horrified. To play the game, Grace must hide from the family until dawn, but Alex whispers for her to meet him in their room. Grace says no, she wants to play. Cameras are turned off and the windows and doors are locked. Family butler, Stevens, plays a record while Grace finds a place to hide. The family arms themselves with hunting weapons while waiting for the record to count down. Grace finds a dumb waiter and hides inside the lift. Becky advises her son to stay behind, knowing his worry for his new wife. They leave Alex in the game room with Charity guarding the door, but Alex goes into the servants' quarters to find Grace. Charity finds the game room empty. They start searching for Grace. Fitch struggles with his crossbow. He excuses himself to the bathroom. Grace crawls out of the lift, ripping her dress. When it gets caught, Grace hears the maid, Clara, looking for Georgie. She hides from her. A hand grabs Grace from behind. It's Alex pulling her to hide behind the bed. Clara walks inside, thinking that Georgie is hiding there. She hears a crash and peeks out the door. Grace watches as a bullet hits Clara. Emily excitedly goes into the room, thinking she got Grace. Tony, Daniel, Becky, and Helene walk in schooling Emily for her mistake. Grace overhears them talk about a ritual where they need the bride alive when they leave with Claire's body. Alex hurries Grace to pack up and leave. Grace is still in shock, confused at what happened. Alex pulls Grace into the servants' corridors just as Emily comes back for her gun. Grace is shaken with fear. She puts her shoes on. Alex reveals that since she pulled the only bad card tradition, says that something terrible will happen to them if they don't sacrifice Grace. Grace is furious, thinking that he knew she is in danger, but he insists that he didn't. Inside the bathroom, Fitch hears their voices from the vent. It focuses on watching a video on using a crossbow. Alex tells her that they would have both died, like his uncle and cousin. 
if they didn't play a game after getting married. Alex thought he'd lose her if he told her about the curse earlier. After expressing his love, Alex instructs Grace to wait for him in the service kitchen. He unlocks the doors from the security room. Grace rips the bottom of her dress to move easier. She finds herself between two doors, not knowing which one leads to the kitchen. Tony and Daniel carry Clara's body when Grace walks into the hallway behind them. She runs to the other side, where Emily continuously fires at her missing entirely. Grace escapes to the study room. She tries the phone, but it doesn't work. She hears a sound nearby and hides. Daniel walks in from the door. Grace is frozen in fear. Daniel pours himself a drink. He gives her a 10-second head start before calling for his family. Grace runs as Daniel counts down. Daniel finally announces her location. Charity is disappointed that he lost Grace. Daniel questions his wife's morality, but Charity reminds him of her past, saying she'd rather die than lose what she has now. The rest of the family joins them. Daniel despises how they act as if what they're doing was normal. When Emily notices her gun missing, Fitch offers his crossbow. Another maid, Tina, tells the family she saw Grace, but Emily pulls the trigger on the crossbow hitting her. Tina moans in pain, interrupting Helene's speech. Helene swings her axe on the maid, ending her misery. Becky suggests using the cameras. The others agree, but Helene wants to stick to tradition. The family argues before finally deciding to use the cameras to find Grace and Alex. Grace goes into the game room and takes a shotgun. She sees herself in the mirror. She's disturbed at what she's become. Alex reaches the security room. Grace enters the service kitchen. She sees that the door is still locked. She attempts to shoot at the lock, but the gun isn't loaded. She hears whistling nearby. Grace hides in a hallway. Daniel notices the cameras are back on. He suspects that Alex turned them on. Back in the kitchen, Stevens is preparing tea. Grace crawls quietly, avoiding him. She loads the shotgun as quietly as she can. She locks the gun with a click as Stevens starts singing and the kettle whistles. The lock on the door is disabled. Alerting the two, Grace aims her gun at the butler. Demanding him to let her go, she pulls the trigger. The ammunition is fake. Grace slams the teapot on Stephen's face. He swings a kitchen knife to block her, prompting Grace to find another way. In the security room, Alex destroys the controls with a fire extinguisher just as his father enters. Alex chokes Tony, threatening him to let Grace go. Daniel calms his brother down, allowing Tony to knock Alex out. Grace hears Tony and Daniel from afar. She opens the elevator to hide, but she finds the last maid, Dora, inside it. Grace assures her that the family is looking for her, not Dora. Instead of letting her hide, Dora yells for the family to get Grace. Accidentally, her hand pressed the button and it start. Dora gets crushed inside in it. Tony handcuffs Alex to the bed. Stevens announces that the windows and doors are unlocked, and Dora is also dead. Tony goes ballistic at the news. Grace listens from outside the window. Celine claims that it's Tony's fault that Alex lost his way. Tony argues that Alex always hated the family. Helene believes that Alex is just afraid of who he truly is. Helene recounts how she regrets trying to save her husband. She should have done the deed herself. Alex is the only one who'd seen Mr. LaBelle when he was a child, leading Helene to believe that he would lead their family and would betray Grace in the end. Downstairs, Fitch chats with a friend on his phone. Grace drops appearing on the window behind him but he doesn't notice. Finally out of the house, Grace runs down what was her wedding aisle. She heads for the gate, but stops when she sees someone with a flashlight outside. She hides in the barn just as the other person enters. Grace waits for the person only to find that it's Georgie. She is relieved to see Boy she walks up to him, but he shoots her on the hand. Grace screamed before knocking the boy unconscious. A goat startles her, causing her to fall into a pit where the dead bodies of the previous sacrifices are disposed. Grace struggles to climb up a ladder with an injured hand, hurting her hand further with a nail. Smoking outside, Charity sees Grace running. She shoots her but misses. Charity goes inside and informs Stevens where Grace is. Grace reaches the fence. She can't climb due to her injuries. A car drives nearby. Grace desperately squeezes between the fence and asks the driver for help. The car did not stop and drives away. She sees another car coming. She hides in the woods. Stevens reports that Grace has gotten out. Daniel jokes about the situation, angering his father. Tony reminds him that if Grace lives by morning, they will all die. Alex uses his handcuffs to grind himself free. Emily and Daniel dispose of the maids in the pit. Daniel thinks that their family deserves to die. Emily argues that her kids don't deserve that. Stevens chases Grace. He tackles her down. Grace refuses to give up, choking him until he collapses. She takes the car to escape, not noticing that Stevens is still alive in the car. Grace calls the operator for help. The vehicle has been reported stolen. The agent shuts it down remotely. The car stops in the middle of the road. Steven catches up and shoots her with a tranquilizer. Grace wakes up in the car. The Ladomas family is glad that Grace is being brought back. Stevens turns up the radio's music in celebration.
celebration. Grace kicks him in the face, causing the car to crash. Grace climbs out of the overturned car. Daniel finds her. He knocks her out with a gun. He tells his father to come out from hiding. Alex is still handcuffed when his mother joins him. She informs him that they got Grace. She also tells him that she doesn't want to hurt Grace, but her family comes first. Alex says the curse is not real. Becky asks him that he wouldn't have let Grace pull a card if he didn't believe in the curse. Alex tells his mother that he left them because he was tired of the family's sadistic traditions. He expresses his love for Grace, saying that he chooses her over his family. Becky doubts this. Grace wakes up on a sacrificial table with Tony chanting above her head. Daniel hands his father the ritual wine which the family passes down to drink. Grace screams under her mufflers. Tony lifts a blade over her. Before he could stab her, Tony and the rest start vomiting blood. Daniel frees Grace. Alex is finally off his handcuffs. Daniel explains that he poisoned the wine, but not enough to kill his family. He hides with Grace, but Charity holds them at gunpoint. She shoots her husband. Grace steals the gun and smacks her on the head. Grace goes to comfort Daniel, but he insists that she leaves. Tony finds Grace but she is no longer scared. She grabs a lantern and knocks him down. The lantern falls and burns a curtain. Becky shoots an arrow at Grace, but misses. Alex finds Daniel dying on the floor, begging that he still needs his brother. He sits next to Daniel's body in grief. Becky chokes Grace. Grace grabs the tablecloth, letting the puzzle box fall. Grace fights back, hitting Becky repeatedly with the puzzle box. She stops when Alex calls her, seeing his mother's body. Alex cries, mentioning that his brother is dead. He asked Grace if she'd stay with him after all that happened. She doesn't answer. Alex touches her face, and Grace finds comfort in him. Then he holds her head tight, finally coming to a decision. Alex grabs Grace and calls for his family. The remaining members of the family come. Emily and Tony mourn for Becky. Helene pushes them to continue the ritual. The adults hold Grace down. Alex looks down on his wife with a knife in his hand. Grace looks up at him, pleading. He made his choice. Alex plunges the knife down, but Grace pulls her arm, letting him stab her shoulder. She wails, aiming the knife at them. Helene draws out the curtains. The sun has risen, causing Fitch and Tony to flinch. Helene begs for forgiveness from Mr. LaBelle from his empty chair. They wait for the worst, but nothing happens. Flinch laughs while the others are confused. Helene thinks that Mr. LaBelle has given them a second chance. She goes to attack Grace, but she explodes in front of everyone. The record starts playing as the house burns down. Fitch, Charity, Emily, and the boys die. Tony challenges Mr. LaBelle, arguing that he'd been loyal his whole life. This still doesn't save him. Grace laughs at the family's condition. Only Alex left. He apologizes to her. Grace denies him. She removes her ring and throws it at him. Alex explodes. Grace tired and fed up. She wipes the blood away. She looks at the chair and sees a glimpse of Mr. LaBelle saluting her. Grace leaves the burning mansion and sits on the steps. She smokes a cigarette, which she took from Becky's body. Kaiji returned to Tei's corporation underground labor camp. He spent all of his money and he got into debt again. Kaichi plays a game of dice and he's on a serious losing streak. He gives all of his money for one last roll. Everyone gets up and they place all of their money in Kaiji. Kanji rolls his dice. Suddenly a man from a crowd takes them. He tells that they're loaded. Everyone wins a huge amount of money. They decide to give all of it to Kaiji. That way, he will buy some time at the surface, and he will have a chance to make money. He will use this opportunity to buy freedom for his friends. Company staff shows up. Take Kaiji to a room where he meets Yoshihiro Kurosaki. He took Tonigawa's place after Tonigawa lost the e-card game against Kaiji. Kurosaki tells Kaiji that he has two weeks to make that 200 million to buy freedom for himself and his friends. He gives only one million to Kaiji. After that, the staff unconscious him. Kaiji wakes up in the middle of the street, finds out that he has a watch that counts down time for his temporary freedom. He wanders around the city. Kaiji tries to make a plan on how to make 200 million yen. He goes to a homeless shelter where he takes a warm dinner. He sees Tonigea is there too. He tells him about his quest to make 200 million yen. They have a rather friendly talk. Tonigawa tells Kaiji that he won his freedom. Tonigawa challenges Kaiji to a game of shogi, a two-player strategy board game that is the Japanese variant of chess. If Kaiji wins tonight, will give him valuable information for winning 200 million yen. Kaiji tells Tonigawa that he doesn't know how to play shogi. Kaiji then sees that a woman is looking for him because of his room number. He goes away from the table after he comes back, he finds out that Tonigawa ran away with his money. Kaiji gets a call from Tonigawa. He tells him that he left him the information under the shogi board. It's a business card from Tai's underground casino. 
Tonegawa instructs Kaiji to go there. Next day, Kaiji visits the casino, and there he meets a man named Kotaro Sakazaki. Kotaro tells Kaiji about a pachinko machine. That machine can give him one billion yen if he wins. Taro tells Kaiji that the winner of the game will take the balls of every person who ever lost the deal. He watches a man who is playing the game. He loses at the very end. He immediately uses a special card to let money from ATM. He loses again, and the staff takes him away. The game is spectated by a mysterious member called Ichizu. He has a special interest in Kaiji. The duo leaves, and Kaiji tells Kotaro that he figured out that the swamp is rigged. Kotaro tells that he hoped that Kaiji would notice that. He invites Kaiji to his place. Kotaro tells that he plans to win the game. He needs Kaiji for that plan. He presents Kaiji a duplicate of the swamp he made. A woman comes there, a woman named Yumi Ishida. Yumi works at Taiai's casino to pay her father's debt. The swamp surprise would help her a lot. Kotaro then explains his master plan to Kaiji. Yumi will smuggle a can of beer with a magnet inside the casino. The staff won't search her. She will give the can to Kaiji and he will bring it to Kotaro. Kotaro will play the swap. Two of them will swap cans and Kotaro will guide the ball with a magnet. The group has set its plan into motion. Everything goes with flow. Suddenly, Kotaro gets surprised when he fails to move the ball with a magnet in the can. He goes to land more money with the hope that he will win, but he fails again. Ichizu shows up revealing that Yumi betrayed them. He told her that Kaiju pushed her father to his death, and with that false information, he's controlling her. Ichizu gives Kotaro another chance. He tells him that he will repay his debt if he wins in another game. Kaiji exchanges Kotaro's pachinko ball for 400 yen. He tells Ichizu that he will beat the swamp, and then he leaves. Kaiju then checks his clock only to find out that he has seven days left on the surface. The duo visits Ichizo to take part in the game. Ichizuo guides them to a room where the game will occur. Ichizo announces the start of the game. He calls princes and the slave. The player has three doors in front of him. The princess is located behind one, while the lions are located behind the other two. The player has three buttons in front of himself for opening the door. The player doesn't know which number represents a certain door. The princess is his wife. He asks her which number is assigned to her door. His wife tricks him, and the player gets eaten by the lion. The wife then gets a nice amount of money for a betrayal. Kaiju is next, and the princess is Yumi who still thinks that Kaiji pushed her father. He tells Kaiji to open the door number two while saying how much he hates. Kimi then tells Kaiji to open door number three. Kotaro immediately tells him to open door number one. Kaiji is confused as he tries to think. Suddenly, he hears Tonigawa voice. He's shocked to find him standing behind one door. He tells Kaiji that he needs the determination to win. Kaiji opens the third door. He wins the game. Kaiji thanks Yumi for her help, but she tells him that Ichizu told her what to say. Angry Kurosaki advises Ichizu not to make a mistake by accepting Kaiji's challenge of beating the swamp. That night, Tonigawa visits Kaiji. Kotaro and he allies with them. He takes Kaiji to an empty apartment. He shows him a large hole in the floor. He reveals to Kaiji that he did that for two years. He also tells him that the Ichizo's office is below this room. Kaiji gets a call and he returns with Tonigawa only to find out that Yumi has returned. She regretted working with a Ichizo. The group makes a plan. When Yumi shows up, Tonigawa tells the others that he doesn't trust her. Yumi leaves at that time. Ichizo was setting up the pins on the swamp. Before heading into the casino with his friends, Kaiji checks his watch. He sees that he only has a few hours left. The group arrives and Kaiji immediately sits in front of the swamp, ready to win, while Ichizo is watching everything behind the cameras. Kaiji inserts the card. He pulls the lever and balls begin to fall. A lot of them manage to pass the pin area. Ichizo shows up and he reveals that Kaiji is cheating. He thinks that Kaiji has swapped the pachinko balls with smaller ones. He reveals that Humi betrayed them by recording the conversation. He goes to check the size of the balls. He gets surprised when he sees that the size is the same. Kaiji then tries to tell the truth to Yumi about her father, but she doesn't believe him. Ichizu runs to his office to check his equipment. He sees dust on it. Kaiji and Tonigawa used a magnet to swap the equipment and the pins. Ichizu gets back, but he's not worried too much. He is relaxed because knows that the ball cannot enter the final hole. Kaiji and Tonigawa's conversation tells that the swamp, the seat, and the floor are tilted, so the balls cannot enter the hole. However, Kaiji came up with an idea to fill the pools in the apartment above. They tilt the entire building by little. That way, they will level out the swamp. Kaiji is still losing his balls. Ichizu makes a dirty move. He tilts everything back with a special remote. He also sent his man to bring his so-called neutralizer. Kaiji loses every ball. He's devastated, but suddenly he figures something out in the bathroom. He asks Kotaro and Tonigawa 
to give him all the money they have, because he has a plan. Kaiji then pulls out his last money. Kotaro gives him the money he saved up for his grave. However, Tonegawa leaves, because he doesn't think that Kaiji will win. Kaiji gets back and he continues to play. Ichizo gets horrified when he finds out that the holes have begun to fill up with balls, because he messed up by using the remote. Now it's only a matter of time before the ball will fall into the jackpot hole. Kaiji again loses every ball and once again he fails. Tonigawa shows up and he gives him money for more balls. The last four holes begin to fill in. The one goes for the jackpot hole but suddenly it's blown away. Ichizo is full of happiness because his man brought the neutralizer, which controls the airflow from the jackpot hole. Kaiji and his friends won't give up. They believe that they will beat the rigged machine, but they don't have too many balls left. Soon they'll lose every ball. Humi decides to trust Kaiji. She pulls up her credit card and thanks to her, Kaiji continues to play. Ichizu now knows that he's doomed. Ichizu tells that he was in the underground labor camp once. He passed the brave men's road where lost to his best friends. He rose to be a member of company. He offers Kaiji a draw, and he tells him he can leave debt free. Kaiji declines the offer of Ichizu. Kaiji and his friends are impatiently waiting for the jackpot. Kaiji screams from the bottom of his lung. The ball gets into the jackpot hole. He and his friends manage to beat the swamp. Kurosaki calls for his man to take Ichizu away. But before they take him, Kaiji walks up to him. He gives him a friendly, motivational speech. He tells him that he will rise from the underground again. He drops the grudge. The group splits the money. Kaiji pays company for the release of his friends. He still has a nice amount left with him. Kotaro says his goodbyes as he heads out to get back to his family. Tonigawa challenges Kaiji to one last bet. They pack their money into the trunk of their car and go to a remote location outside of town. Tonigawa challenges Kaiji to play a notorious e-card game which they played in the first movie. Kaiji can see Tonigawa's cards because of the car mirror and then smoke manifests. Kaiji informs Tonigawa that he's aware of his smoke machine trick, but the trunk catches fire and the money turns into ashes. Both of them are now without their jackpot. However, before he leaves, Tonigawa gives some money to Kaiji as he could buy gift for his friend. Kaiji with his friends celebrating his victory and their freedom. Tonigawa is watching him from his car. He faked the burning of the money. He tricked Kaiji. Kaiji walks through the city with a small amount of money in his hands. He is ready for new challenges and victories.